So I've always taken care of women who have breast cancer at high risk for relapse, and I've always sort of wondered why can tumors be dormant in a cult for years and years and then recur again. And so looking at the totality of the literature when we first started to do the study, there were um, studies uh, and experiments that made me think that perhaps a copper depletion study could promote tumor dormancy. And so I thought that would be perfect for my patients who had breast cancer who had high risk of relapse. So in our copper depletion study, we have a very high risk for relapse group of patients. They're patients who have stage three breast cancer, they're patients who are stage four NED, and what that means that they have no evidence of disease, but their cancer will come back because it's come back once and somehow they got rid of it. We didn't really care how they got rid of it as long as when we examined them, we did blood tests, we did scans, we didn't see any evidence of it. Those patients were at very high risk. So the drug we used was called tetrathiamolybdate. It's a copper depletion compound. And we were lucky that a lot of the issues surrounding doses were worked out by uh, Dr. Mariver and Dr. Brewer at the University of Michigan. So what we did is that we actually took the doses of TM that were safe uh, and applied it to our patients. So our dose is 180 milligrams that we give them over the course of about four weeks to rapidly copper deplete them, and then we titrate it down to about 100 milligrams. But we have some patients who are on 40 milligrams a day because that's all they need to be copper depleted to target. Yeah, so TM is a pill that you take daily. Copper is a really interesting element. Um, it's involved in multiple biologic processes, which are important for tumor progression, you know, both within the tumor itself and also within what's called the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so in the tumor microenvironment, it's the environment around the tumor, not the tumor itself. But what it does is it facilitates tumors doing their bad things. So for example, um, uh, we know that uh, tumors, uh, in order to move, there needs to be a certain amount of copper because the way things move is that you know you have extending thylopodia and the way it sort of moves around. And copper is critical for that process. So you pull copper out of a pool, they don't have the copper in order to move around. Copper is important for a lot of different um, enzymes, which we could say condition the premetastatic niche. So what that means is that it sort of softens up the area the tumors like to go to. We also know that tumors, when they spread, they have to land on like a landing pad, it's collagen based. So when you pull copper out of the system, that landing pad, that collagen scaffolding gets totally messed up too. And we know that because we've done the preclinical studies to really begin to understand uh, how, tumor can, how copper can affect the tumor microenvironment. So the um, primary endpoint of our study was to look to see if copper depletion could reduce what we call VEGF R2 positive endothelial progenitor cells. Those are, this, those are the bone marrow derived cells that flip the angiogenic switch. So what that means is that they transition tumors from being um, avascular and micrometastatic to being vascular and ma macrometastatic. And so we had thought that if we got rid of that step based on a lot of uh, prior work we had done that perhaps we could prevent a relapse. And so yes, we found that we reduced these VEGF R2 positive endothelial progenitor cells or EPCs in patients who are copper depleted, but then we really wanted to understand what more we were doing. So we actually went back to the lab uh, and we looked at the effect of copper depletion on the pre-metastatic niche of a triple negative breast cancer um, um, a cell line, which was an implanted into a xenograft model, to look to see how it affected metastasis. And so what we found was that lysyl oxidase, which is a very important enzyme in tumor progression, was markedly reduced, really abrogated in the lungs of the, of the mice that were treated with TM versus water control. So then what we did is we went back to the stored patient samples and we looked and we assayed for lysyl oxidase. And, and similar, we found that the lysyl oxidase was markedly reduced uh, in the patients uh, who were copper depleted. So we feel like we're starting to build a story as to what are the different processes that we're uh, affecting. You know, one of the things we're doing right now is that we are sort of closing in on a very interesting assay to understand what does it do to uh, collagen uh, cross link products because in, in the animals we know that we totally mess up collagen. We not only do we get rid of any of the cross linking where tumors need to land in order to spread, uh, but we also see that we, uh, we change the fiber length. We have a group up in Ithaca, Cornell Ithaca does a lot of great work on figuring out like, you know, 
not only how bigger these fibers are, but you know, sort of how, how do they uh, integrate uh, and interdigitate. So, so we've been able to find a partner who I think can help answer that question in, in women who have no evidence of breast cancer, but you know, there's stuff happening with collagen in their body. So we're also looking at circulating tumor DNA. We don't have that data ready yet, but we've got a lot of really interesting things to really try to understand, like at what step of the process is, is copper affecting the process of tumor metastasis? And, and if this you know, makes a difference, then you know, uh, perhaps we could uh, treat people who we know that their tumors rely on copper, and it can be a very sort of maintenance therapy to reduce relapse and improve the cure rate, because that's really what we want. I think that this take-home message is that if we really want to move the needle on curing patients who have breast cancer, especially triple, neg triple negative breast cancer, where I think this might have its greatest value, is sometimes you need to take a chance, and, and, but it needs to be grounded in science. And what we've done is we have, found, we have really followed the scientific trail on this, um, on this whole concept really from the very beginning. And, but at the end of the day, if it's going to be something which is useful in patients, it needs to be uh, studied in a formal fashion, which is a randomized placebo-controlled trial. That is really the only way to do it. So follow the science and then sort of go back to proving one way or the other whether or not the strategy is one which is worthwhile for patients.